And uh, right now, I'm going to bring up Senior Roy Clavery to introduce our next speaker. A 1993 graduate of Montgomery Bell Academy, R.A. Dickey is a former professional baseball pitcher who played 15 seasons in the MLB for the Texas Rangers, Seattle Mariners, Minnesota Twins, New York Mets, Toronto Blue Jays, and Atlanta Braves. After spending his early career as a conventional starting pitcher, Dickey learned to and perfected the art of throwing a knuckleball. In the 2012 season, he dominated opponents, posting a 20 win and six loss record with a lead leading with a lead leading 230 strikeouts. Additionally, he would be selected to his first All-Star game, would be named the Sporting News Pitcher Pitcher of the Year, and would be the first knuckleball pitcher to win the Cy Young Award. From 2013 until his retirement, Dickey was one of only two knuckleballers in the MLB. Outside outside of baseball, Dickey authored the book Wherever I May wind up a memoir that provides a story of overcoming extraordinary odds to achieve a game, a career, and a life unlike any other. He now lives here in Nashville with his wife and children. Please join me in welcoming R. A. Mr. R.A. Dickey to MBA. Thanks for uh, being here and thanks, Wynn, for having me. Uh, I was going to sit down, but I think I'm going to stand up because I'm, I'm kind of hoarse. I have a 40-acre a farm here right outside of, of Nashville proper, we'll call it, and it takes me about 20 minutes to get here, but I've been outside a lot and yelling at animals and all that, so I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit hoarse, uh, or I'd be in the chair. Um, what I thought I could do today um, is just basically, I'd like to share a little bit about my journey here at this school and um, some background to that, uh, hopefully in an effort uh, just to be as transparent as possible with you and as vulnerable as possible so that, you know, this is a nice, intimate setting. So I feel like we can really, um, you may be able to glean a lot of things from my experience here and my background. So I'll just start by telling you that um, I grew up in East Nashville and m my parents were divorced very early on in my life, uh, seventh, eighth grade. Um, and I had a lot going on at my house. I was up in public school and East Nashville, and um, we were probably lower to lower middle income family, just trying to make it. My mom, she was a, a waitress at a bar and did hardwood floors and did all she, she was a, a salesman at, remember the store Athlete's Foot? She was, uh, she sold shoes at Athlete's Foot. She did whatever she could to take care of my sister and I. We were, we were uh, siblings. I have one sister who's younger. And uh, I lived with her up until I was 13 years old and she had um, an addiction to alcohol and had to go to some rehab and um, we have a great relationship now but it was really rough early on we were kind of latchkey kids come home you know the key would be under the mat and we'd be on our own until six seven eight o'clock at night you know as 10 11 and 12 year olds and so you can imagine uh the the mischief that we could get into uh, so that's where i came from Okay, like that, that was my, my life up until I was 13. And uh, my grandfather had a son named Ricky Bowers. Ricky Bowers was um, a good athlete, and he went to school here, and I kind of came over and watched him play and fell in love with this place from an early age, just chasing him around the gym. Uh, he was about 11 years older than I was, 10 or 11 years older. And so my exposure to NBA was through my grandfather and my uncle. Um, and as time went on, I had hopes of being here. Uh, now, I didn't know how that would manifest because of our, um, our economic situation, but I always wanted to come here. Um, fortunately, I got a financial aid package or a scholarship package to enter into the seventh grade. Now, I, I was in seventh grade at Wright Junior High, which was a public school in East Nashville, where, um, you know, I mean, as you may imagine, that was probably 1988, 87. I mean, there were 16-year-olds in seventh grade there and pregnancies going on and all kinds of stuff going on over there. So I went from that, that was my culture growing up, to over here. So you can imagine the uh, awakening uh, that was in store for me when I came over here. 
So I went from seventh grade at Wright Junior High and entered, I was young, entered into the seventh grade here at NBA. And my world changed. Um, coming from being a latchkey kid to a place that, that had boundaries and rules and discipline and mottos and entitlement and all kinds of things that I had to process through in order to survive here and hopefully eventually flourish uh, was tw quite the challenge. And I was underprepared and undereducated uh, to be here. Um, but they uh, cared for me in a very special way, um, which I really appreciated. So my, my maturation as a student, gentleman, and athlete here, um, I'm gonna, uh, I'd love to share with you an experience I had in seventh grade that speaks to, I'm going to take my jacket off, that speaks to why I think places like this are valuable. Um, and not that they're not in the public school system, I just feel like they're not as available as they are in a place like this. So having come from a space like that over here, I, I grew up loving literature. Um, that was my first love. I love sports. I played sports. It was a refuge for me to escape the reality that I was in. I was also, unfortunately, um, I, I am an adult survivor of sexual abuse. So I was going through that at the same time. Uh, I was abused when I was an eight-year-old twice. Um, and never, never told anybody about it until I was in my uh, early 30s. So I brought that baggage with me here as well, okay? And nobody knew that here. Uh, my parents didn't even know, um, the little that I saw them after seventh grade. But I will say this about this place. One of the places that I would escape uh, often was into books, into literature and into sports. That those were my sanctuaries away from the pain of um, a, a tough childhood. Um, and I, I got really good at compartmentalizing things, at being able to stick things in folders, put them away in order to um, survive in a culture like this, which was overwhelming for me. I mean, who among us in seventh and eighth grade had it all figured out, right? Like, I mean, that is like the bottom of the hill, right? So I was at the bottom of the hill with all this baggage, and nobody knew. But I'll never forget going into a seventh grade classroom, and Miss Brewer was my seventh grade English teacher. And there was uh, an assignment uh, early on in my seventh grade year uh, that was right we were going, we were, we were studying different types of poetry, you know, sonnets, haikus, um, all kinds of iambic pentameter, trochaic tetrameter, all, all kinds of stuff in seventh grade. And I, I loved poetry. I read poetry from being early on. I hit it, but I read it. And um, I felt like I was tiptoeing into a place where uh, that was being cultivated and grown and there were freedoms there that I don't know if I ever really felt before. And she gave an assignment, go home, write two poems, any, like use any technique you'd like. So I wrote a haiku, and I also wrote a, uh, just a regular free verse uh, poem. And she identified in me that I might have a gift for uh, the written word. And um, she didn't tell me about it, but there was a poetry contest that was coming up at St. Cecilia Academy right across the street. It was a big kind of citywide competition. And there were math awards given out, science award given out, and there was a poetry award given out. And she called me um, into her office and said, hey, all right, I know, I know you, this might not be your thing. You may have a game, and, um, but I, I'd love for you to come to this fine arts uh, competition at St. Cecilia. And so I said, okay, I will if I can. So I got my grandmother to drop me off at St. Cecilia, and I met Miss Brewer and a few other students that were there from MBA. And I was sitting down, and I was just kind of twiddling my thumbs because, you know, I didn't know why I was even there. And the poetry uh, award, someone stands up. We're going to give out the poetry award for the city, et cetera, et cetera. And they called my name because she had entered the poems that I wrote for that assignment without telling me. And what that did for me uh, was really life-changing, right? It really freed me up to kind of grow into uh, a, f a, fuller, a fuller version of myself from that which I thought was possible. And so I, 
I felt like that in reflection now is kind of a microcosm of what this place offered me. It offered me a lot of freedom. Um, yes, with boundaries, which I think are incredibly important. Now I have four kids. My oldest is 18. So I have 18, 17, 13, and 8. And so boundaries were good for me. I came from a place that had none, and I craved it. Um, I didn't know what I, I needed as a seventh grader, but when I came over here and I was getting demerits for having my shoes untied or my shirt tail untucked or not saying yes, ma'am, or, or, or walking by a piece of trash and not picking it up, like those are the kinds of things that I needed uh, without knowing that I needed them. And so that structure and that discipline and that, uh, those sets of boundaries for me really helped me order my life in a way that was much different from the lack of order that I had as a child and as a teenager or a preteen in sixth, seventh grade in East Nashville. And like I said, I was a latchkey kid. So what I did throughout high school in seventh and eighth grade was spend my time with different sets of friends. Um, and I, I write about this in my book um, about when I got my license, what, what my MO was, um, because my mom at that time was, was at Cumberland Heights, which is a rehab facility here locally. And uh, my dad had just remarried and we didn't have a great relationship and we were still in East Nashville and I just needed to be closer to the school because I was, you know, I played quarterback on the, on the football team and we had Saturday practice. Like, I just needed to be over here and I didn't want to wear out my welcome in people's homes. And so if you guys will remember when we would go into the libraries, and I'm sure you guys share this memory, we'll go into libraries and, and on, these, on these long sticks were all these newspapers, you know, and you could flip through them, right? And we had them. We had New York Times, USA Today. I mean, those were available in the, in the library here. And so I'd go down there into our local paper, which was called the Nashville Banner which is no longer in existence. We just have the Tennessean now. And I would flip through and I'd go to the want ads or the, the apartments for rent and I would find all the addresses of these apartments that were for rent and vacant. And I always travel with a sleeping bag in, my, in my, the trunk of my car. And so what I would do is I would identify within a two or three mile circle from this school uh, these houses that were vacant. And I would basically squat in them. I would go and I would, I would inevitably there would be a key either on the door frame or under a mat or under a rock or a window open and I'd get in there and, and I would spend the night. At least I had some shelter there and didn't have to sleep in my car and I did that. That was my MO. And so I, I share that with you to share with you how, how uh, I really appreciated being close to a place that I really felt cared about me as a human being. Like, at least if, um, if I had to be alone, I, at least it was by my own choosing. When I, was, when I would go home, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on at home, and, and I just I didn't feel right there. So at least in these places, near this place, uh, I felt like I was cared for in a real, you know, now I've done a lot of work, right? Like, I've done a lot of counseling, a lot of therapy, and all that through my life, both as an athlete um, and as a human being. And in reflection during those times, I see how ridiculously unhealthy it was to sleep in, call, in, in vacant homes as a 15 and 16 year old boy. So don't think that I'm advocating for that, okay? Please don't. <laughs> I'm just saying that is my story and I wanna be as transparent with you guys as possible. So you never know what one of your students is going through, right? Like. You never know. I've been twice sexually abused. I had an alcoholic mother. I love sports and I was a really good athlete. And that's one of the reasons I was here. Um, but nobody knew that about, about me at my core, that I longed for discipline. I longed for uh, order. I longed for someone to take an interest in something outside of my athletic ability, which Miss Brewer was able to do and identified in me a gift. I loved, like I said, I, I grew up loving the written word. And so that really promoted in me a desire to want to go on and major in English. So I, I, I made it through this place with multiple summer schools and multiple people that loved me well. And all the sweet things that Roy read about me, I appreciate that. You guys need to know, as we all probably know already, um, and something I would love for you to share with your boys, is that we, none of us, are self-made men or women. We are all the products of people who have loved on us well. 
Um, and so that, that for me is this place. This place represents that for me. Now, it wasn't a perfect place, right? This is not a perfect place. This is not, not it should not be an idol. Um, but it was a place for me during those years that really cultivated me as a young man. Um, yes, because of the discipline and the rigor, the academic rigor, and the, the great athletics and the facilities and the amenities and the food. Gosh, the food in the cafeteria. I don't know if y'all have been to Hogwarts over there, but it's, it's something special. Now, we didn't have that. We were, eating still, we were still eating the cafeteria that was in the basement years and years ago of the ball building. But all that to say is the food was still good. And I'll never forget, like I knew kind of my, you guys now know my story. I was, you know, stuffing everything I could in my backpack and my, just so that I'd have a snack for dinner or something like that. But uh, this place just, it, it resonated with me in a way that was very special like that. Um, and it was because of the people, because of people like you who pour into students every day. But again, I think that the lesson is, and if you hear what I'm, I'm telling you at its, at its core is that you never, you never really know. So be curious. I had people that were curious about my story here and were curious about me as a human being and asked me really great questions. And even when I would look off in the distance and was an obnoxious ninth grader, they cared enough to keep pursuing me. Right. So, and I think that's where I know, and this is, this is a confession to you. And it's something I often repent for with my own children. Um, to my own children about getting wrong, but sometimes they will not react to my advice the way that I think they should, right? <laughs> and so I will stop pursuing them for a moment when really what they're crying for is for them to know that no matter how I react, no matter what I spit back at them, they want to know that I'm going to be there and I'm not going anywhere, right? Like that's what we need to really thrive is the safety to be free, right? And the freedom comes from knowing that people care for me and they love me and they're cared about me and they care about me intimately. And so that was, that, that was my experience here. And I was very lucky. I was very blessed, very lucky. I had other parents that loved on me well. Like I said, you know, I am the product of a lot of people who have really poured into me. I mean, athletically here, the coaches that I had uh, that helped uh, develop my athletic ability. I went to the University of Tennessee from here uh, on a baseball scholarship and was able to play in the Olympic Games in 96 um, because of people who were here. Um, so when I won the Cy Young in 2012, the Cy Young Award in Major League Baseball, the first talk I gave in Nashville was here at an assembly because that was an award to be shared with so many people that had poured into me. And um, I'm so thankful for that. So those are all great things. But like I said, this is not, th this place is beautiful, um, but it's, it, it, it wasn't perfect. And, you know, to be perfectly honest and fair, I thought, today and I told Wayne, I said, what I thought I'd, I'd like to do is share what I loved about this place, but also what I wish that was different, right? Because I think we can all learn from that. And do I think that it's different now than it was? You betcha. The 1980s here and are a lot different than the 2010 here, right? 2010 to 20 here. So the things, the thing, a couple things that I wish were different. I wish that I would have been better educated about the socioeconomics of and the diversity around. I think when we were here, we might have had four African Americans on campus. I came from a place that was incredibly diverse, from Hispanic to African American to okay, like all of it. And so when I came over here, it was an awakening in the sense that I wondered why, like I, I carried with me the question throughout my time here, like why, like why is it this way? Why aren't half the student population African-American, right? I wish that I would have been taught about the whys around that, that we, that we weren't embarrassed of the whys of that, or there were real definitive reasons for that. It would have given me much more empathy 
in the moment. And I think that is one of the defining attributes of any well-groomed human being is the, is the ability to empathize, right? And that's, I think I missed that component here. The, the, the education around that and the financial, um, like, I, I mean, the tuition here is what it is. I'm not sure. And I don't even know how I got, how I paid for it. Like, I, I mean, maybe my grandfather paid, he's gone. We never got to talk about it, but I think that I would, ended up paying maybe $1,500 a year to come here with all the financial aid that I got. But like, why was that important? Why, why did it occur that way? How does that work? Like, I wish I would have had an education around that. Um, and that, that's one of the things that I wish were different. The other is, I wish we would have done more things with girls. I wish we, like, like it was, it was, uh, like I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to do that well. I didn't know how to talk to a girl well. Like I didn't know how to, you know, I didn't grow up with a model, a good model. My parents got divorced early. And the only memories I have of my father and mother are not what I felt like I should be displaying to another girl when I got older. And so I was never given a model. So when I got here, I almost wish that there was a, not a, maybe not a home ec class, but a class to, on how to, how to be a good husband or how to be a good, how to ask a girl out, you know, how to go on a date, what's appro appropriate, what's not appropriate. Like now we, we are in a culture that is grotesque as far as what you can access, what you can take a picture of, what you can send to a girl, what a girl can send to you. There are stories all over the place about people falling down all around that. We do not need to be embarrassed about that. We need to confront it. And so I wish when I was here that that was something that we did. How do you treat a woman? I think that's an important class. Um, what is appropriate in a male-female relationship at different stages of that relationship um, because it took me a long like I when I got to college I didn't know how to do that like I don't think that I mean I'm thankful that I married the, the sister of one of my classmates right like I was fortunate that way I went home I went home from school with a buddy who was on a football team and I was in seventh grade here and I walked in the door, and remember, I came from a different place. So when I came over here, I felt a little bit like an alien. And so the first person that asked me over, like, I was like, yes, I'm coming. I, I, I'll be there. Yes, can I ride with you? Because I don't have a ride, but I, I want to come. And so I went home with him. His name was Bo Bartholomew. And Bo uh, took me home with him. He was an eighth grader, and I was a seventh grader. And it was the fall of my seventh grade year. So I was really trying to figure it out, man. I was lost. And he wrapped his arm around me and said, hey, come home with me. And so I did. And when I walked in the door, there she was. There she was. Long, blonde hair, looked like a lion's mane. She was doing her homework. And I remember seeing her and thinking, I don't know what feelings these are, but I like it. <laughs> and so she would, she would scurry off. And I, of course, I, I didn't know what to do. So I just you know, I, I don't think I uttered a word to her for a year, right? Like maybe, hey, what's up? You know, <laughs> something like that. That's all I need to do. Uh, but eventually we became friends. And if it weren't for that, you know, she, eh, you know, I don't know what would have occurred because I, I really didn't understand the dynamics around that. And I wish, um, I just think that there's an importance to that uh, now that I am a husband and father. Um, so those were a couple of things that I really wish were different. Um, we got about 20 minutes and I'd love when, uh, to take any questions that you guys may have about whatever it may be, um, not in my life now because of this place or when I was here, anything, I'd love to open it up to that. Yes, ma'am. Those kids through that transition and, and on a daily and, and long term basis. What a great question. And here, uh, I think this speaks to my one or two gripes about this place when I was here. I think it would, I think it's all about resources, right? So 
if you if you if I were to come over them knowing where I was pulled from because you know they know where you're pulled from it should have been mandatory for me to be um, in a after school or some kind of supplemental uh, with a, a social counselor uh, you know just to help me acclimate right so that's what happens what happens when you go to college as an athlete you get a, a person that helps take care of you right that that you can go to and say hey man how do I get my books like right or how do I you know how do I interact with this person on in a confidential setting so for me I would have a support staff for that demographic on campus. Yes, they serve the greater population of students, yes, but they, it is mandatory for those that you pull out a lower, like the socioeconomic, you know, the, the lower, maybe lower income, middle income families that are coming from a different place that you know and can foresee that it's going to be an abrupt change academically, athletically, socially, economically that you go ahead and help educate them about that right away. Like there's no real excuse for uh, this place or any other place with the resources that we have available to us not to help the student with that part. Um, and, and yes, they have great tutoring and they have, but you've got to ask for it. And so I didn't want to ask, I was embarrassed. Who wants to ask as a seventh and eighth grader? I have a son, okay, he's got a dyslexic diagnosis. And it's hard on him. He's got a diagnosis that allows him to utilize learning services. Okay, he's in seventh grade. Does he utilize learning services? No. Why? Because he feels some inherent shame about it, right? So if it were mandatory, if it was something that took the burden off of him, where he had to proactively go do it, and the faculty just said, or the administration just said, hey, this is just part of the gig. You're doing this. And this is why, because we love you. And this will help you. And then, the, then you're freed up, because you've got to be there. And if you learn two or three things in that, even though you have to be there, it's worth it, right? So that is something that I would, I would offer um, if, if I were doing it again, right? Does that, does that answer your question? OK. Yeah, great question. What else we got? That's a wonderful question. I'll say this too. Let me let me. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of insight into um, my my professional change. Um, and what I mean by that is, I was drafted out of the University of Tennessee in the first round of the Major League Draft in 1996. Okay, I was a fastball pitcher, which meant I threw a fastball, a curveball, a changeup. That was that was who I was as a pitcher. Okay, so. As I grew professionally, I think I got maybe two, two and a half years of major league service time as a conventional pitcher, which means when you turn on the TV or you look at ESPN or your sons are playing, they're throwing fastball, they're throwing a curveball, they're throwing a changeup, slider. Those, that's the conventional arsenal of pitches that a pitcher will throw. Well, that's what I threw, and I, I threw it well enough to get drafted as a first rounder, play in the Olympics, and then go on to my professional career. But as I got older, my velocity, which is what keeps you in the major leagues, okay, those guys are throwing anywhere from 92 to 102 miles an hour, okay? And I threw 96, 95, but every year my velocity would start to go down a little bit just through general attrition. And so at the end of my career, my 10 years with the Rangers, I was throwing probably mid 80s, mid to high 80s and getting tattooed. Like I was up there, I'll never forget. There's a guy, you, you guys may not know this guy's name, but I'll never forget. I was in the big leagues trying to just hang on tooth and nail to the dream of being a major league pitcher and was given every opportunity to fail and was up there. And I threw a pitch that was about an 86 mile an hour fastball that I thought was a good pitch on the outside corner to a guy named Vladimir Guerrero. <laughs> Some of you guys may know who that is. Some of you guys may not. But Vlad Guerrero uh, was really, really good. He was an AL MVP, an NL MVP, and he's got a son now that plays for the Blue Jays. He's going to be a superstar. All that to say is I threw that pitch, and by the time um, I heard it, I heard the collision of the bat and the ball. 
But by the time I got my glove up, because it looked like it was coming right at me, by the time I got my glove up, the guy in center field was catching it. I'm, I'm not kidding you. That's how hard he hit that. And I, I thought to myself, wait a second, like, I'm not going to survive this. Like, if I want to stay here, I've got to be able to come up with something else. Okay. Fortunately, I had a pitching staff of coaches that were Oral Hershiser, who you guys may know, and uh, Buck Showalter was the manager and had some great people around me that said, hey, we know you can throw a good knuckleball. Why don't you be a full-time knuckleballer? So those in the room that don't know what a knuckleball is, let me give you a quick tutorial. Okay. So every pitch in a Major League Baseball player's pitcher's arsenal is meant to impart a certain type of spin onto the baseball to make that baseball break, move a certain direction. For instance, if I threw, a, if I threw what they call a slider from a right-hander to a right-handed hitter, I'm spinning that ball so that it's spinning such that the last 12 inches before it gets to the fir first front part of the plate, it breaks like this, away from the right-handed hitter. It comes in like this and moves that way. It's called a slider. Every pitch in a major league pitcher's arsenal is meant to impart spin on the baseball. Now, I did that for the first 10 years professionally, three years in college, six years high school. So that's for the, for the previous 20 years plus my little league days, let's call it 30 years, that's what I did. I tried to impart spin on balls to make them break, manipulate the trajectory so that I would fool a hitter. That's how you have success, ultimately can make a living playing the game. A knuckleball is antithetical to that, okay? It is the subtraction of spin completely from the baseball and throwing that baseball in a way that between the, there are 106 seams on a baseball, okay? The seams, the lack of rotation, the air resistance, the humidity, the weather, all of it interacts with the surface area of this baseball in a way that makes the break of that pitch very chaotic. So if I throw a knuckleball to you, you will be able to read the writing on the baseball as it comes to you. It's a freaky thing. When you're, when you're a hitter and you're trained to track spin every pitch, spin, 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 and then all of a sudden this pitch is thrown at you and you can see the little MLB emblem coming on you, like bouncing around, it's intimidating. And so that's what they wanted me to do. Now, imagine being a golfer for a second, okay, and you're a right-handed golfer and you're good, but you're dwindling. And then – your golf coach says, hey, man, that's, you're not going to be very good anymore doing that. Why don't you try to, to golf left-handed? Okay, maybe that'll work, right? So that's where I was, okay? And so I had to try to figure out a mechanic, mechanically, that could produce a ball that at the very worst would spin a quarter of a revolution from the time it left my hand to the time it got to the catcher's mitt. A quarter of a revolution, okay? I had to be able to feel that out of my hand. The texture of the pads on my fingers, the length of my fingernails, the soil on the baseball. I mean, all of that works in a perfect symphony to be able to execute that pitch 110 times a game, okay? So that's, that, that was my task. Can I do that, okay? Having not done that for the previous 30 years of my life, that was my task. Now, when you get it right, I think Bob Euchre said it best. The easiest way to catch a knuckleball is to wait till it stops rolling and go pick it up, right? <laughs> like it's hard to hit and it's hard to catch, right? Because it's moving so erratically around the zone. Uh, I read a quote from, um, from uh, a hitter that I had faced and I just owned him, a knuckleball. I think he was like 0 for 21 off me. And they asked him one day, they said, what, what, tell me what is so hard about hitting R.A.'s knuckleball, and he said, and it was the best quote I think I've ever heard, he said it was like trying to, trying to throw a paper airplane, I mean trying to, uh, trying to hit a paper airplane on a windy day. Like you just, it's just hard. So that will tell you just the difficulty as a hitter when you get that pitch right, and that's why you can make a living on it, but it's very hard. That's why when I played there were only two of us. Tim Wakefield, who was the only other guy I played for the Boston Red Sox, won 200 and something games, and myself. And the reason I share that professional story with you is because 
I felt like the groundwork for being able to be self-aware enough to understand that this person that I was, I'm never going to be again. Now what? The groundwork for the now what was laid here on this acreage, right? Because people taught me the value of being honest about what you weren't good at, right? I think that is another incredible attribute for us to be able to teach our young people is don't be afraid of coming to terms with that which you're not good at, the self-awareness around that. And the hardest part of that is how do I take my ego out of the equation when everybody's told me how great I am for so long because I was really good at a con being a conventional pitcher. Put that over here and come to terms with the fact that I'm, I'm not very good anymore, right? And be okay with that. How does that motivate me to a work ethic that could produce another 10-year career as a knuckleballer? And ultimately for me, that's what happened. Ultimately, I accepted their challenge. They said, hey, why don't you go down and be a full-time knuckleballer? What you, and they were great. They were honest with me, like good teachers should be, I think, with, with kindness. They said to me, I, I got pulled in the office, and I'm thinking my major league career, my dream, it's all done. I've only got two years of service time. You know, I've barely made enough money to put a down payment on a home. I've got a kid. I've got two. I've got one kid. I've got one on the way. Like, what, like my mind is spiraling, right? And with kindness, these people came into my life that – saw me as a conventional pitcher and they said, hey man, like that's not gonna cut it at this level anymore. And you need to know that this is a, you know, we're trying to build a World Series team here and you need to know that what you're producing now, it's not gonna be good enough, okay? But we think that you have the makeup and the attributes to be a good knuckleball pitcher and we wanna give you the freedom to go down there and fail until you figure it out. And that was a life changer for me, right? For them to say that, for them to say that. And so you have all the, you have these moments in time that are these benchmark moments that you really only know upon reflection um, that are big, big boy moments, right? That are life changers. That was one for me when they cared enough about me to say, this is not what you do well, but we believe in you for this, right? They identified that in me as people who work with, kids and boys in particular, there is something inherent in every boy that wants to be good enough, right, at something. It's just there. Like, how do I identify the skill that I do really, really well? That's what y'all can help with, right? Really, really be vigilant on that and curious and care enough to be curious. And that was helpful for me. That was a, a benchmark moment. Here's the other benchmark moment for me as a human being. I was at the end of my rope. I had just embarked on trying to learn this knuckleball pitch. It was 2006, and just a snapshot into Major League Baseball and what we, what we go through as an athlete. There's 162 games in a year, okay? 162 games played in 183 days. Okay, remember, I'm married, and I've got kids. And if you are a wife with a husband in here, think about that doesn't even count spring training, which is another 45 days. So at the end of the story here, I'm at 200 plus days away from home. Okay. So it was, and like I confessed to you very early on, I didn't get an education on how to be a husband. I didn't get an education on how to be a dad. I didn't get an education on, on how to navigate that part of my life well at all. And so it was 2006, Our, my marriage to Ann was rough. Um, we were trying to figure it all out. And I was carrying around on this baggage from, like I told you early on in my story of the sexual abuse and how that was impacting me as both a professional and as a father and as a husband. And I was at the end of my rope. I was at the end of myself. And I thought a lot of times about just, this is too much, it's time. Like, that's, that's me being incredibly transparent with you. Um, but that's where I was, okay? And I had a guy come to me and sit with me. And this is what you want. If you've ever encountered, and here's, here's the stat, just so you guys know some stats. As boys, one in six. 
One in six. Think about your enrollment. One in six, okay, when you get down to the nitty-gritty, have gone through some form of sexual abuse at some, in, at some level, okay? And that immediately leaves, us, leaves a mark forever, okay? So for me, there was, and there's still not a day that ever goes by, like people will say, you know, I'll hear them say, well, you ever feel like you're going to get to the, to the other side of that? And I say, no, that's not the point, right? The point is how can I be taught to hold what's horrible about the world and what's beautiful about the world and take steps forward? Like how can I learn to do that? How can I have people in my life as teachers, coaches, administrators that care enough about me to teach me how to do that well? How do I walk forward with the crap and the beauty, right? Taking steps forward. I didn't know how to do that. I had a, a guy sit with me in that for a minute and suggest a counselor. And I went to see him. And it, it was a benchmark moment for me. And here's what was benchmark about it in a nutshell. So when you go through sexual abuse, your growth is stunted from the moment that that happens to you until the moment that you start doing work to try to repair that, period. So I was still an eight-year-old boy in a 32-year-old man's body because I had never done the work to try to get to reconcile that in any way okay I'd gone through MBA I'd been able to fake it a lot I was great at manipulating people and making you see what I wanted you to see because guess what sexual abuse survivors they're great at surviving they're great at surviving right and that's how I would survive in a place like this now I had glorious moments here with people that loved me and I felt a very authentic fulfilling type of care but until I was able to recognize it and confront it on my own, I was never going to get to the other side. I didn't know that. How do you know that as an eight or nine year old boy, right? So I carried that up until I was 32 and I'm in this place. And so he sits beside me on our first day together. And I, I, I know for the first time that I'm about to tell somebody that I've been sexually abused and I'm about to unpack that and how that happened and where I was and was it my fault? And what part did I play in it? And who am I? And what, like the questions just start pouring and flooding over you. And he sat beside me and just listened. He didn't try to fix it. He just listened. And he looked at me. And it was the first time in my life I'd ever heard these words. But I had never really invited him in as well. He said, all right. He said, I'm, I, I hear your story. I hear parts of your story, and I'm going to get to hear a whole bunch more, and I, and I can't wait to hear that part of your story. But you need to know, no matter what you tell me, no matter what you say, I will never leave you like I'm not leaving you. Like he's, he, To have another man sit beside me and say, hey, no matter what, like I'm here. That was a life changer for me. My career... From that moment forward, as I started to unpack my, my life with him, carried directly over into my performance as a pitcher. And so from years 2006 to 2012, I was on this journey um, that was very tough. Now, he was, I didn't tell my wife, right? He was the first person I told. And so part of the development, and how is that relevant to where we are now and here, it's relevant because it's real, guys. Like, you have people in your high school right now that have been victims of sexual abuse, that have been victims of domestic abuse, that have been bullied, that have been, like, you, you just don't know, right? But the more empathetic that we can be, the more that we can participate in other people's story, like you guys are with me today, the more you're able to have the um, optics to be able to recognize when that's occurring and really pour into those people. And um, so that, that's my encouragement from that story. And here's what I would, if you have a pad, I, I'd love for you to write this down because this is, this is important what I'm about to say. And if you don't, if you don't remember anything from my talk, uh, I'd love for you to remember this. So like I said, part of being uh, a survivor of sexual abuse is I was really good at surviving, grinding, like grinding it out like working harder, doing it better, right? I could do that. I could trick you. I could trick myself even. But here is the hope, and this is kind of what I want to end on, and then I'll answer two or three more questions that you guys may have uh, before we end. 
Um, here's the hope. And it always needs to end in hope, right? So here's the hope. The hope is that I am able to get from survivor to craftsman and from craftsman ultimately to artist. Like that's the progression, okay? And this is what I mean. When you survive, you don't really get to experience life at its fullest, right? You're always looking for angles. You're always trying to see the shortcut because you're always trying to protect yourself and be safe, right? Because I don't want to be harmed anymore, right? So I'm looking for places to be safe. That's surviving. As a craftsman, I'm starting to come to terms with my gifts. I'm starting to recognize my gifts because I'm having success doing something. I really feel an inner passion about it. And here's the kicker, and this is where you guys come in. I have other people help cultivate it with me, okay? I have other people come in, step in, and say, man, you are really good at that. How can we create an environment where that can be something that you do regularly? Um, how can we surround you with people that can draw that out of you? That's a craftsman, okay? You're starting to learn a craft or a craftswoman, okay? You're starting to come to terms with your gifts and have people around you start to help cultivate that in you. Okay, and then ultimately, and this is a journey, guys, we are all in a process, right? I, a, quick, a quick aside is one of the greatest things in athletics that I ever learned that is a perfect analogy and metaphor for uh, our lives as human beings is um, don't be fixated on the result, okay? Yes, you have a hope out there that you hope to achieve. Did I, uh, did I ever dream about being a, a Cy Young Award winner? Sure, it was a dream, but if it weren't for my investment in the process, become process fixated people, okay? So if I'm throwing 110 pitches in a game, I'm making 110 separate commitments in 110 different moments. I am immersed in the process as an athlete, okay? Move that over to a human being and human development, okay? If we become obsessed with the process of growing and um, maturing and being self-aware and all these things, if we, if we care about that in that moment instead of that's the person I want to be, then you'll eventually be there. The 2012 Cy Young Award, that was a byproduct of an investment in a process. That was a byproduct. That wasn't, I'm going to see that, I'm going to go get that. That was, I'm going to see this, that which is, basically, how do we teach people to live the next five minutes well? All right, that's it. Okay, that's craftsman. The artist is the person that now gets to teach, right? Like has gone through their journey in a way that they have something to give. I would, retired in 2017. When I retired, it was really hard. I could still play, but I knew it was time to be a dad and a full-time husband. And so I left the Atlanta Braves. I turned down $8.5 million to do it. And I, I don't regret a single second. And this is why, because I had drugged them all over creation, yes, but I felt in my inner being that I needed to be a full-time dad and a full-time husband. And so I left that behind in 2017. 2018 was a really hard year. I was so used to being in a clubhouse with other guys and had that camaraderie, had those people that poured into me and that we could help each other. Like you, you, can't, you can't manufacture that outside of that space. It's really difficult. You can have little small groups. I have Bible studies I go to that I love and I play pickup basketball at CPA at six in the morning and I love that. But that everyday kind of bond that you have between you know, sisters or brothers that you are with and play with, it's hard to emulate that. It was very hard in 2018. Okay, in 2019, I was asked to help with a high school baseball team. And I got to start to give what I had, right? And there's the artist, right? You guys are artists. You'll have a tremendous amount of wealth, to, okay? Yes, in your own personal journeys, you may be surviving, okay? But as educators and administrators, you guys are artists. That means that you are qualified and equipped to be able to pull out of people that which they thought they were never capable of. 
And that is an incredible, rewarding experience. And so that's, that's what I want to leave you with, okay? Survivor, craftsman, artist, okay? Let that be kind of the heartbeat of, of when you look at a child, when you look at a seventh grader, and you notice and you see they're all surviving. They're all trying to get past the zits and the awkwardness and the demerits and the, you know, the boundary pushing and the rebelling. And like they're all in that place, right? But have this vision for them that they could ultimately arrive at a place where they're going to have so much to give back uh, as artists. And I, you know, guys, what I mean by artists. I don't mean, you know, and although it would be awesome if you were a great painter, but <laughs> artists as people. Artists as people. Y'all been great. Any other questions? I got time for about two questions, three questions. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. I see you. So, you know, there are MBA or at the schools that we, our visitors are from who are struggling, um, yet who are facing maybe less strenuous circumstances that you were in. Uh -huh. um, and I'm kind of wondering if one of those kids came and talked to you and said, like, I know you had some struggles and came from some different circumstances, but were able to push through. Is there anything you would want them to think over or their families to think over in terms of, like, is this the right place for me to thrive? Is there something that's either not in place or something to do with me that helps me decide, like, am I in the right place or not? That's a great, great question. You know, I think the question to ask first and foremost is safety. Like, is this a safe place? Right? Because if it's a safe place, then it's a, it's, chances are it's a right place. Okay? And so if someone comes up to me and I'm in a school as a coach or a teacher and they confide in me that, hey, I know because I've been vulnerable with my own story, maybe in a class or in a coaching situation, and they come up to me and they say that, then my first question um, to myself is, am I, am I providing a safe place for this, right? And what does that mean? And there may be some protocols to put in place that are great to talk about as administrators and group settings that uh, will help facilitate that. But that would be the first question I would ask. Is, is, is this safe? Am I qualified? Like if, if I come to you and you've never experienced sexual abuse, but that's what's on my mind, and I say, hey, listen, I've had something really hard happen. Um, you know, I was at a party and somebody forced themselves on me. And this, like, do you ask yourself, do I feel qualified to make this a safe place for what's about to occur? Like, that's got to be number one, right? And if you, if you determine that it is because you've thought it over and you want to keep going down that road, then be vulnerable, be transparent with your story, and then offer resources. Safety, resources. Okay, that will, that will really help. Um, and, and guys, be proactive on your flights home and driving around. Like, think about uh, the arsenal of resources that you may be able to utilize if a situation like that ever does occur. Like, put yourself in that real life moment where I'm RA and I'm a seventh grader again and I feel close enough to you to share something very intimate and hard. Are you in a place that you can offer me help in a safe environment? Did I answer your question? Okay, you're welcome. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. What factors go into making a really good team culture and positive for you in that clubhouse or in that organization? Oh, man. Um. <laughs> The, the winning cultures that I was around, I went to the playoffs twice with Toronto, and um, I felt like we had this there. Furthermore, we went really far once with Texas, and all of them, you know, in reflection, and even like my off seasons, I would think, what makes that different than the Mariners when we stunk and had the best? Listen to this team that I was on. You guys will appreciate this. When I was a rookie in Texas, this was our team. Alex Rodriguez at short. Okay, Pudge Rodriguez behind the plate, Juan Gonzalez in right field, Andres Galarraga at first base, okay? Uh, shortstop was uh, Royce Clayton, Rusty Greer in left. To say that we had seven out of our nine players were all-stars, guess where we finished? Last. And so you ask yourself, you know, why, right? 
Well, in a culture like that, you know, and it's different. It's different because we're in the media, but it's not different because this is, I'm going to use a different word, but people are concerned at that level with building their personal brand. Okay. So what does that really mean at your level? Well, that happens too. And what's that called? Being selfish, right? Like ego, id, whatever label you want to put on it. Okay. It's when um, people aren't as concerned with pulling in the same direction and want to just capitalize on the moment for themselves. That, that is a cancerous clubhouse. Okay, here's the other thing. When people choose principle over convenience, okay, when people choose principle over convenience, if you have a clubhouse where that's the majority, now that's not ever going to be everybody, but it could be the majority, then you're going you're gonna to be a winner. You're going to be a winner. Principle over convenience. Well, I don't want to run. It's more convenient for me to go home, right? Principally, you need to get more endurance. Choose principle, right? When you have people who rally around that, you'll start to see things change, okay? But you have to teach that. Like, that's, that's, that's a vi that, that is a rare thing. So you have to really teach that, cultivate that. But teams, ultimately, that have that as their calling are very successful, um, both in business. And I go around and I talk to, you know, Merrill Lynch and IBM, and, like, it's all the same, those teams. You know, if that's really the heartbeat of that team, they're going to they're gonna thrive. Somebody else had their hand up. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, where did it come from? The, the courage and the, the, the desire to share your, your, your stories and your struggles? Well, thank you for saying um, So, the, uh, to answer your question, like it gets back to some of my earlier points. And there's this thing called the law of three, right? When you hear something three times, it helps preserve in your memory. Three times. It takes at least three times. So hopefully this is the third time I've said this. So you guys will be able to carry this with me. But here's, here's a previous point. Like I am the product of a lot of people who have what? Loved me well, right? So part of the answer to that question is I had a lot of encouragement. I had a lot of people who sat with me in really hard times to unpack that stuff. And look, I started writing my, I told you I love the written word. I, I, was, I was in Tacoma, Tacoma, Washington, playing for the Seattle Mariners in AAA in an old craftsman house looking over the Puget Sound on an air mattress. That's where I lived. And started writing my story in 2008. I didn't come to terms with my story, right, until 2006. So it took me two years to process through that with a, a professional guy who's become an intimate friend and discover that I wanted to, it would be very cathartic and therapeutic for me to start writing about that. Okay, I had journals from back in 1990, 89, 88 that I drew on from, that you read. If you read my memoir, that was writing from when I was in seventh, eighth, ninth grade that I kept because that's, that's what I did. That was helpful for me. So when I started writing my story, it was in 08. It wasn't published till 12. So it took me that long to really work through it. And so back to the last point that I told you I wanted you to take out of here, right? Survivor, craftsman, artist. An artist takes what he has and he gives it away. He gives it away, right? So with me, I had been given a gift. It was a gift of perspective. It was a gift of value. It was a gift where I felt worthy. Because when you go through something like that, you feel completely unworthy. You feel... Um, animalistic and um, less than human. It took me a long time to get to the place where I felt like I could be confident in sharing that because I knew that once I did, the, it's like, anybody seen The Matrix? I, I took the blue pill, right? When Morpheus says, hey, 
I got a red pill, you'll wake up just like you've always been. You take the blue pill, it's a game changer. Like you're going to wake up and you're going to see the world for what it really is. I took the blue pill, right? And so I knew I was never going to be the same. And so once I could reconcile that story over the course of five years and felt confident enough to be able to give it away, that's what you saw manifested in the manuscript that you read. Um, but it came with a lot of time, uh, honesty with my wife and my mom and my, because I talk about my early relationship and with my mom and I, you don't want to wound people, but you want to tell the truth. And so there's all that to, to, to negotiate through. And I'm happy to tell you all that I have the best relationship with my mom now that I've ever had. And a lot of it is just because of that book, because we were, we were in a place where we had to do the work if we were going to have a good relationship. And we did. And she, she got it. Um, so the product of a lot of great people and the hopeful artistry of giving away what I got, what I was given, was what that book was. Great question. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Guys, I hope I didn't bore you. Um, I went over. I'm sorry. Thank you.